Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the operating systems engineering class. So in this class, we'll be looking at another synchronization problem, which is a reader and writer problem. And we'll also be looking at uh, low level details of how semaphore is implemented or uh, best practices of implementing a semaphore. A brief review uh, in previous class, we looked at what semaphore is. Uh, semaphore uh, is an integer that takes non-negative integer values and it can be accessed through two operations. One is wait and the other one is signal. These two operations are atomic and wait decrements the semaphore and if the value is less than zero, then the calling process is blocked. Similarly, signal is just an increment operation which increments the uh, value of semaphore by one. So, and we also looked at how we can use semaphore in producer and consumer uh, problem. So here, as you can see, before, uh, before inserting an item into the pool, a producer waits on empty semaphore and similarly consumer waits on full semaphore just to make sure that the queue is not queue is basically not uh, empty and the full full indicates like empty indicates empty and full are two semaphores which actually count the number of slots or number of buffers that are uh, that are either full or empty in the pool of buffers and we also looked at condition variables so condition variables are uh, similar to to mutexes, similar to locks, where for each condition variable, there is a queue which holds all the processes that are blocked on that condition variable. Okay? And as the name suggests, condition variable is used to block on certain condition. So process may want to wait until certain condition is satisfied. So all, the pro all those processes which want to wait on certain condition can use the condition variable to enroll themselves into the queue of waiting processes. And then a uh, signal is a, sig, sig, uh, is a function that is used to signal that the condition has been as occurred, okay? When the signal happens, operating system usually picks uh, one or more processes in the waiting queue, and then it starts, uh, it puts them into the ready state so that they can start executing when the CPU becomes available. Okay, and unlike semaphores, uh, condition variables are uh, non, like they're not counting. So there is no counting involved when we use condition variables. They are just Boolean variables, which indicates whether the condition happened or not. And this is an example of condition variable. Here, each condition variable is implicitly associated with a mutex. For instance, here, as we can see at the signal, what uh, signal we are using a non-full is a condition variable. So here we are using uh, a short form of condition variable where actually when we use signal, what's really happening is we actually release the mutex associated with the condition variable. And then we raise the signal and then we acquire the mutex. So every condition variable is also associated with the corresponding mutex. So condition variables themselves doesn't uh, are not alone. So every condition variable have mutex that will be held, like uh, that that's used to uh, coordinate access to this variable. And uh, we also looked at uh, various ways in which the processes get signaled. For instance, uh, like when the signaling happens on a condition variable, there are two options. One, the first one we call signal and wait. Here, the signaler or the process which actually signals the condition, it uh, it blocks, it get blocked. And uh, or rather it doesn't get scheduled immediately. Whereas the waiting process, which is waiting on uh, this condition variable gets scheduled. So what happens is, when the process signals on a condition variable, we'll look into the wait queue of that condition variable to see if there are any processes waiting and we'll pick one of the processes and then schedule that process 
before scheduling the signaled process. Okay. And then the other option is signal and continue. So here, when the process get when the process signals a condition variable, this, the signaler or the process which actually signal the uh, condition variable con will continue execution. Okay. So what happens is when the signal occurs, we look into the wait queue and we we pick one of the process into the wait queue and mark it to be ready. We change the state of that process to be ready, and then we continue execution of the signaler. Okay. And then when the scheduling happens, uh, since the process or like, since we have put one of the waiting process into the ready state, we pick that process and we start executing that process. Okay. However, there is a problem here. So the problem is, so when the signal happened, so when the signal occurred, we marked one of the waiting process to be in ready state, right? And then we continue the execution of signaler. However, by the time the process which is in ready state gets a chance to execute on the CPU, the condition on which it was waiting may not be true. Okay, one example is uh, as described below. Here, let's say let's assume pool is full. Okay, and now producer one is producer. There are two producers, P1 and P2, and P1 is now waiting for one of the consumer to take one item from the pool because pool is full. Let's say consumer comes and signals, consumer consumes an item and signals the, uh, signals the producer. Now, let's say we are using signal and continue. Here what happens is when consumer signals, we, we, take, we take P1, which is now blocked, and we put it, we mark it ready, okay? Rather we put it in the ready queue and we continue execution of uh, consumer and consumer finishes execution. However, before P1 gets a chance, let's say another producer P2 comes along. Okay. So here P2 will continue execution and P2 will actually use, use up the slot that is consumed by the consumer. Now P1 is already in the ready queue. By the time P1 gets a chance to execute on the CPU, pool is already full because P2 came along and filled up the one empty buffer, right? So this is tricky. And signal and wait is actually easy to implement and it actually makes it easy to prove certain things uh, about condition variables whereas signal and continue it's hard uh, it's hard to prove certain things because the condition on which uh, the process was waiting may not be true after like by the time process gets the chance process gets a chance to execute on the cpu exactly so this is uh, as we saw like here, if we use uh, signal and continue, uh, we can have producer, by the time producer comes here, the item, the pool may be full. Okay. So one way to avoid this is to use uh, busy waiting. So this is one way in which we can avoid the problem with the uh, signal and continue, sorry, signal and uh, signal and wait. So, sorry, I'm, uh, signal and continue. So here what happens is we will not, uh, the process that is blocked, the process that is, uh, uh, the pro uh, every process it actually checks, it actually waits for the condition in a loop. That way it knows that uh, uh, when, the, when the condition is set or like when the condition occurred, it comes out of the wait. However, if some, some other process invalidates the condition, the while loop ensures that uh, the condition is actually true uh, when we start executing the rest of the code. Okay. You can look into this code and try to understand, try to convince yourself how, um, how the signal and wait, the, of how the problem caused by, sorry, signal and continue is avoided by using while loop. And we also look. Uh, we also understood that uh, uh, mutual exclusion is provided by uh, three different synchronization primitives, lock, and we saw that lock is not powerful enough when we want uh, multiple processes to be accessing certain resource. And we also looked at semaphores, uh, including binary semaphore. And we'll be looking 
uh, in today's lecture, why binary semaphore is uh, not enough. And we also looked at condition variables and associated lock with it. In this lecture, we will be looking at readers and writers problem. It is one of the uh, similar to producer consumer problem. It's a famous uh, synchronization problem that helps us to understand different subtle issues that happen between synchron that happens in process synchronization. In the next lecture, actually, we'll be looking into another very famous problem called dining philosopher's problem. So readers and writers problem. Consider there is a data object that is shared among multiple processes. Okay. And we want to allow concurrent reads. And we, we only want to allow exclusive writes. That means we can have multiple processes reading a variable. But there are but there should be no writes happening at that time. However, when the data object is being written to, we only want one process to write to the data object. As you can imagine, this is very classic problem, right? This issue happens many times while we are coding. So if you have multiple processes that are just reading a variable, we want all the processes to be able to do that unless there is a process which is writing, right? Similarly, when we are when when multiple processes are writing to a variable, we want to ensure that uh, only one process gets access uh, can write to the variable at a time. Okay. So how can we solve this? Let's uh, let's try to list down the constraints of this problem. First, we want to ensure that uh, readers can writers can proceed only if there are no readers or writers. Okay, we want exclusive access to the data object for writers. And readers can proceed only if there are no writers. That means if there are re other readers, readers can go through. However, if there is at least one writer, reader cannot go through. So in order to ensure that only one writer can uh, access the data object, let's use a, a binary semaphore block write. Okay. And also to, uh, to count the number of uh, processes that are reading, let's use a shared variable. Okay. And then in order to, in order to get, uh, in order to ensure the shared variable, like the concurrency access of shared variable, let's use one mutex. So here, uh, so in summary, we have one uh, mute semaphore or binary mutex, uh, sorry, binary semaphore, which is block write that ensures that only one writer has access to the data object. And we have readers, which is a uh, shared variable, which just counts the number of readers that are currently reading the shared object. Uh, and then we have mutex that control access to the readers variable. Okay. Let's see how we can implement our reader, reader and writer using these three uh, variables or like the uh, using two semaphores and one shared variable. Okay. So reader, reader needs to first hold on to mutex because it is modifying readers. So when a reader comes in, it increments the number of readers. And reader sees, when a reader comes, it sees if it is a first reader, then it will block write. It will try to hold on uh, to block write semaphore because it needs to block all the writers, right? So, and then a reader does the reading. And then eventually, once the reading is done, it uses mutex to decrement the number of readers. But if it is the last reader, that means when readers, the value of readers is zero, then it will unblock writer because if there are multiple readers we don't want to uh, unblock write we want to actually block the write so we don't release rather we don't yeah we don't release write whereas when if it is the last reader we release write okay now writer is very simple it just waits on block write block write is a binary semaphore it waits on block write and if, if once it gets uh, block write, once it gets access, once uh, the block write gets signal, it does the writing, and finally it uh, signals block write. So, he, so the code that we just saw 
we saw that if uh, when the first reader the first reader let, let's see what happens here in the readers so if there is what happens if there is a write okay if there is a write that's happening and the first reader comes along okay so if there is a write when the first reader comes along it's actually get blocked because the value of reader will be 1 and we are waiting on now block write but if the writer is if the writer is already in then the, we will not we will be waiting on block write okay so exactly so when the first reader comes the first reader will be blocked if there is a writer and all the other readers also will be blocked because uh, they'll be blocked on the mutex because we are using readers to we are using mutex to increment the reader shade variable right and last reader, when last reader exits, it actually signals the waiting waiter, waiting writer. If there is a writer, we signal the writer to continue execution. And when the writer exits, if there is both reader and writer, the which one gets scheduled depends on the scheduler. And if writer exits and reader goes next, then all the readers will fall through. That means, let's say, uh, if there are 10 readers that are waiting, and uh, when we have one writer which exits, and if one reader gets access to the shared variable, then all the readers will just follow. Because when one reader gets access to the shared variable, the first reader will block the write. So only the last reader will unblock the write, right? So all the readers will just fall through. So this, although the solution looks good, but it leads to a writer starvation, because as I just mentioned, so if there are 10 readers and uh, if you have a writer, let's say a writer has access to the data object and writer finishes the execution. And when writer exits, if one reader gets access to the data object, then all the readers just get followed because the first reader actually blocks the write. The, the only, uh, the only reader that can unblock the write is the last reader. So all the readers will just fall through. So we get into the problem of writer starvation. So writer may not actually get access to the data object. And as we saw in previous lectures, we don't want that. That is not one of our, uh, uh, that is not the desired property. We don't, uh, we want fairness. We also want to have bounded weighting. We don't want to wait on uh, the on logs indefinitely so how can we how can we fix this okay uh, let's maintain two variables um, two shade variables readers and writers okay which will count the number of readers and number of writers okay. and let's use r mutex and w mutex to control access to readers and writers shade variables and let's also use uh, two binary mute, uh, just two, two binary semaphores, block read and block write, to block readers and writers. Okay. Let's see how we can implement readers and writers with these uh, semaphores and shared variables. So reader, now reader is exactly same. However, we actually now use this additional semaphore block read to allow writer to block the reader. So we, uh, we use this block read. So any reader now before incrementing readers variable before actually entering the reader code, it uh, tries to wait on block read semaphore. So basically this allows a writer to actually block a reader. Okay. So it waits on block read. If it gets a uh, block read semaphore, then the code is exactly same. We just increment readers. And if the first reader will block the right, so on and so forth. So writer, actually now writer also increments, writer now increments uh, writer's shared variable. So here first writer will actually block the reader. Okay. So if uh, similar to the first solution here, the writer increments the writer variable and the first writer blocks the reader and then it uses block write to uh, to ensure only one writer is doing the write. 
and then eventually the last writer will enable the reader so this is good this actually solves the writer starvation problem but if you take a close look at it it actually leads to reader starvation so that means if we have multiple writers waiting so it's the last writer that that actually enables all the reader so this leads to the opposite problem of reader starvation so can there be a solution that's fair to both reads and uh, readers and writers i mean one obvious idea is to use a, a queue of all the readers and writers so they can uh, they can enroll themselves whenever they are uh, whenever they are ready to execute so that we can just schedule the processes based on the uh, pro, uh, based on this queue so to summarize uh, we saw that the readers and writers problem kind of uh, gave us some hint of why synchronization in real world is hard to get to get exactly right to have the desired solution that satisfies all our conditions it's very hard i mean there are many bugs even in linux kernel that has been there for decades and we are actually actively working on it in our lab so if you are interested please email uh, we have some interesting problems in uh, trying to find these bugs in large scale system software such as linux kernel and and how to pick between logs semaphores and condition variables that, that depends on the problem at hand okay and we uh, one thing to remember is logs are very simple uh, more it works for most of the cases actually we can implement all the other primitives by using logs and uh, but the problem is it may not be the most efficient solution because if you have if every process has to implement for instance semaphore it's it's tedious so but logs although they allow a uh, mutual exclusion they don't uh, allow multiple processes to have access to a shared uh, resource like some shared region so condition variables are good and uh, condition variables allow threads to signal each other however the problem there is we need to be careful on uh, what semantics to use either signal and wait or signal and continue and semaphores are more lo uh, low level but uh, i mean these are easy to use but it's uh, it makes it if you don't increment the semaphores correctly you can easily botch up things because uh, it's very hard like imagine a semaphore with uh, with certain count if you don't increment decrement the semaphore only in certain branch of a program it's very hard to debug uh, semaphores so although they are easy to use it's very easy to get them wrong if you don't especially in complex programs when you have multiple paths in a program because you need to ensure that uh, all the paths in the program actually release the semaphore or like signal the semaphore right and now let's look at uh, how these uh, synchronization primitives are actually implemented in real like how can we implement these synchronization primitives and what is needed from the hardware to implement these synchronization primitives first let's look at semaphore so semaphore as we know it has two methods wait and signal wait as we know we wait if the value is less than or equal to 0 if it is if it is greater than 0 we decrement the value wait similarly signal we just increment the value of semaphore and as we can see a uh, signal counts the resource or rather it increments it actually uh, indicates the number of available resources whereas wait consumes the resources uh, by decrementing the value of semaphore okay so how can we implement this uh, in op in an operating system so first let's look at where to implement them okay. can they be implemented in user space no right because we want these functions to be atomic and if uh, if we implement them in user space there is no way we can ensure that uh, this entire function will be executed uh, automatically right 
and there is no hardware instruction that in, uh, that implements semaphores directly so there is and it's very complex to implement them in the hardware because you need to have a counter and you need to have exclusive access to this it's very hard to get them right uh, uh, or like it's it's rather it requires more hardware resources to implement them so typically semaphores are implemented in operating system so they use certain uh, very primitive hardware uh, low level synchronization primitives from hardware using which uh, operating system provides us this abstraction of semaphore okay and uh, and we also saw that uh, from the process state diagram we know that uh, when a process goes to sleep it it will be it will be in blocked state similarly process when it is waiting for a resource it will be in blocked state we can actually use this to implement semaphores in a more efficient way right so when process is waiting so we can actually put the process in blocked state okay and how can we use this to implement semaphore more efficiently so given this what we can do is uh, we can have a semaphore structure that has uh, one variable count that actually is the semaphore variable that counts and then we have uh, we can have a queue that queue says that that queue gives the processes that are waiting on the semaphore so and in very simple way the way we can wa implement wait is uh, wait takes a semaphore a pointer to a semaphore object and it's tries to see if the count is greater than 0 it decrements it and we return from wait however if the count is equal to less than or equal to 0 we add ourselves which is the current process we add ourselves to the queue of that semaphore s uh, s of q is the queue of the semaphore we add ourselves to the queue and we sleep okay the sleep actually will put us uh, in the blocked state okay similarly signal we increment the value of semaphore and once we increment we see if the uh, if q is not empty if the q is not empty we remove the first process from the queue and we wake up the process so that the process becomes we basically put the process state from block to ready that's it so that's that's how we can use uh, that's how we can implement signal and wait so the use of queue enables us to do uh, to wake up the processes that are waiting for it and it also provides fairness right because when multiple processes are waiting they they can enlist themselves into the uh, into this queue and queue also allows us to be fair because we will always um, remove the process in first come first serve order now what is the problem here so the problem is we want to make uh, these functions atomic we want to ensure that when we are actually inside the function wait or signal there should be no interruption so the entire function should execute as if it is a single instruction right so if assuming if there is one processor like uh, assuming if there is only one cpu how can we have this how can we make our entire wait and semaphore atomic um, because on uni processor let's say on, on cpu what are the things that uh, that we can be sure of being atomic reads and writes right so the and so we can assume that the only thing that is atomic in a processor is the read instruction okay because we cannot have half read instruction so only one read instruction is the atomic unit that we can be assured of similarly one write instruction that's atomic right so they cannot be half write they can only be one write or one read okay? so on uniprocessor systems we can assume reads and writes are atomic how can we now how can we ensure that uh, a set of lines a set of uh, assembly instructions to be atomic because on uniprocessor we just know that only reads and writes can be atomic okay so uh, to ensure atomicity let's see why uh, let's try to understand why it cannot be atomic right because of context switches so 
the when we are actually inside the weight we can have a context switch where another process can come and get uh, get scheduled on the cpu okay. basically because of context switches so can we disable the context switches we can by using interrupts because the only way operating system does context switches is because of interrupts either because of hardware interrupt or because system call or because of uh, other interrupts right or else if there is no interrupt os operating system will never uh, does skip cpu scheduling or like it never context switches so we can achieve atomicity by disabling interrupts that's the insight even uh, so assuming that we have reads and writes as atomic we can we can disable interrupts to achieve atomicity it is as shown on the slide so here before entering before doing anything with the shade variable before doing anything with the semaphore we disable interrupts in wait okay and and we enable interrupts when we are exiting from the corresponding methods you can see the same in wait and signal right so in wait we see when we are uh, in wait can exit either because it got the semaphore inside if or uh, it, it adds the process adds itself to the queue so at the end we enable interrupts similarly in the signal we disable interrupts so this ensures that the entire code of wait is executed atomically so because when the process is inside the wait function all the interrupts are disabled so that none of the processes get a chance to be scheduled on the cpu so this ensures atomicity so this is good this is very good but what happens in uh, multi processor in truly multi processor systems where we have multiple cpus or like processors that are executing our code so here as you can see uh, at the bottom we have main memory we have l3 cache l2 cache and l1 cache and and all the processors access the memory through different caches and how can we ensure that uh, we get uh, atomicity of uh, wait and signal in case of multi processor systems because here we cannot even assume that reads and writes are atomic because when a read is happening in one processor we can have a write executing simultaneously in another processor so this is like true true concurrency we cannot assume anything about the in, uh, like instruction atomicity okay and furthermore we also want to ensure that when we read and write the variables uh, since these processors use different caches we need to ensure that uh, the contents of the variables are reflected in all the caches and it's actually uh, very complicated to achieve cache coherency in uh, multi processor systems it's still like open ended problem uh, i mean not not open ended there are good solutions but uh, it's still something we can improve on so is turning interrupts uh, interrupts enough like uh, we on uni process solution we disable the interrupts will that be enough on a multi processor systems no because if you turn off interrupts on one processor it doesn't prevent uh it doesn't prevent other processors from executing instructions right so unless we disable interrupts on all the processors we cannot be sure that disabling interrupts on one processor is enough so if you have to disable interrupts we need to disable interrupts on all the processors and can we use atomic read and write and busy waiting to ensure uh atomicity in multi processors uh, let's look at an example so here so instead of uh, so here let's try to busy wait so we use the same technique for uh, uh signal and continue if you remember so we just did the way, uh we kind of side step the problem by using busy wait so let's try to use the same technique here so let's disable interrupts and let's busy wait on uh, count variable and then we decrement the count in wait similarly we increment the count in signal ignore uh it, it, 
uh, ignore the uh, ignore the missing details here like adding process into the queue ignore them but will this solution work no right because when when you are actually when we are actually decrementing the count let's say in wait we can have other process other processor like the process running on other processor concurrently trying to access the value of count or concurrently trying to write to the value of count so even so this doesn't work even if we are even we are using busy wait this solution doesn't work yeah, exactly so the the uh, the value that we want we are about to access is, is of count that may not be the correct value because the other processors are can we can have multiple processors that are trying to write to s dot count and these are like one processor is trying to read when we are actually doing busy wait so even disabling interrupts and busy wait doesn't work on multi processor systems so what we need is we need we need help from hardware now so there is no way we can do this by just using automatic writes and disabling interrupts because we need to have we need to ensure that uh, hardware or rather access to this uh, memory is synchronized by the hardware because there is no way we can uh, we can see what other processor is executing so unless we have some information from the hardware it's hard to achieve concurrency so we saw actually in the first uh, lecture of a process synchronization series the reason uh, we need to have uh, this automatic test and set instruction right so we need to have that so most of the cisc architecture so cisc stands for complex instruction set architecture uh, for instance x86 is cisc and arm is risc risc stand for reduced instruction set architecture so most cisc machines actually provide this nice instruction called read modify write or test and set so here what this instruction does is uh, it actually reads the old value and it it sets the new value that we want to set so the center instruction is executed automatically so as you can see it reads the old value and it sets it writes the value that we provide into the memory okay and it returns the old value so we can use this instruction to to achieve concurrency on multiple processors okay so here let's say uh, we want to achieve mutual mutual exclusion uh, uh, basically we have critical section we need to ensure that only one process can be executing in that critical section even in multi processor systems how can we do this by using uh, test and set instruction so here we can we can busy wait on test and set so when as long as the uh, the value of lock is 1 we just wait and so basically when we set the value of lock to be 0 that's when we achieve the lock and then at the end we release the lock by setting the value to be 0 so so uh, the value of lock when it is 1 we just wait so by using test and set i mean we can achieve a mutual exclusion basically the while loop is uh, wait and when uh, when we are setting the when we are setting the value of lock to zero that's release so this is correct because uh, as you can see since test and set is atomic only one process can actually set the value of uh, or like set the value of lock so this ensures that the critical section can be executed by only one process this is right however is it efficient no because we are uh, we are busy waiting 
and when we uh, when the critical section is too long or uh, if if the process is spending too much time on the critical section we have multiple processes that are waiting uh, that are busy waiting right so semaphores we can avoid this by using our good old queue right so we can uh, we can use uh, we can actually use some of a queue for the waiting processes so that we can instead of busy waiting we can put the processes that are waiting into the queue so this is the implementation i am reintroducing the implementation on the uniprocessor implementation uh, by using a test and set here uh, we are using uh, the same code however i i am uh, we we are using now logs so on multi processors so we are using test and set so instead of directly modifying s of log we are using test and set to ensure concurrency between multiple processors so before entering wait so we use log we use the while loop we use busy wait to wait uh, on the value of log okay and then there are uh, there are question marks in the there are markers in the code and it's it's an exercise for you to uh, try to see what are the things that needs to be filled there to ensure concurrency so so here when we in the wait we we hold the lock we try to uh, get the lock using test and set so when we are exiting from the wait we need to release the lock the way we can we can release the lock is by writing to lock variable okay we write the value 0 to lock variable that is releasing the lock similarly in signal we try to uh, get the lock by using test and set and then at the end we release the lock okay so this actually ensures that uh, even on multiple processors we achieve atomicity right because uh, when we use test and set only one process can execute wait that way and disable uh, disabling interrupts ensures that uh, on that process on that processor basic uh, disabling interrupt ensures atomicity on a single processor and uh, test and set ensures atomicity atomicity on multiple processors that way we achieve true atomicity even on on single processor and also on multi processor systems so i mean we are using busy wait uh, as you can see we are actually using busy wait right do you think that's a, that's that's of a concern here uh, think about it it's actually i mean not not a concern because uh, when we are so it's uh, this busy wait happens on a single processor right uh, it's it's happening on a processor and since on a multi process system there are actually many processes that are still executing other many processors that are still executing other processes so the continuation happens in the sense even uh, a process is doing busy wait it's not actually it's it's only blocking a single processor whereas the other processors are actually doing work and uh, what about interrupts can we remove like uh, do we still need to disable and enable the interrupts i mean not necessarily because uh, even if we disable the interrupts even if we not disable the interrupts uh, no other process can uh, execute wait because they will be blocked on the lock right however uh, disabling the interrupts will uh, will cause the operating system to schedule another processor another processes on to the processor so it might be uh, basically it might take more time for the uh, synchronization to happen so if you are uh, if you are not context switching uh, it ensures fairness right because if there are multiple processes waiting on a lock they'll all be busy waiting so when the lock gets when the lock is released one of the process immediately gets the lock whereas if the process is uh, swapped out then that may lead to starvation again these are design choices we can uh, either disable interrupts not disable interrupts but uh, uh, there are both pros and cons in disabling interrupts and enabling interrupts uh, especially in uh, multi processor systems when we have uh, test and set instruction 
And so we learned uh, a great deal of uh, process management in uh, like last week and this week, we looked into what we mean by processes. And we also looked into process control block. What are the things that are that are need that are stored by operating system in a process control block? And we looked at uh, process synchronization and how to achieve process synchronization through uh, too much milk problem. Uh, in previous lecture and this lecture, we looked at semaphores. We looked at uh, producer consumer problem. We also looked at readers and writers problem. We will be looking into uh, one one more problem, dining philosophers problem in the next lecture. And we also saw how we can implement semaphores on uniprocessor systems, assuming read and write to be atomic. And we saw that the implementation should happen in operating system uh, by, by disabling interrupts. Similarly, on multiprocessor systems, we cannot assume read and write to be atomic because read and write can happen on multiple processors at the same time. So, and uh, even if we disable interrupts on one processor, it doesn't work. We need to disable interrupts on all the processors. And we saw how we can use test and set to achieve concurrency on multiprocessor systems. And what we learned so far, we learned locks, semaphores, condition variables, and we also learned uh, inner workings and optimizations that can be done in the implementation of semaphore. So in lab two, actually you'll be using, you'll be, you'll be trying to implement semaphores and try to get more hands-on experience with these synchronization primitives. And uh, these are reading assignments for the next week and this covers uh, most of the synchronization aspects that we have discussed last week and this week. Thank you.